everyone and welcome back to Teach Astronomy. My name is Victoria but you can call me Vicky and I'm here with Professor Chris Impey and uh, we are doing an author chat today all about uh, dreams of other worlds. If you guys have been uh, tuning into our Wednesday book chats, we actually finished this a couple weeks ago but holidays and travel and things like that, uh, we're finally getting to do the book chat now or the author chat and uh, yeah this book is all about uh, Unmanned Space Exploration. Uh, it was written by uh, Professor Chris Impey and uh, Holly Henry. And we're going to chit chat. Um, so I guess to start, Chris, how you doing today? <laughs> good, good, very good. Ready to, to talk about your book, I'm sure. Um, so let's see. Let's start from also uh, if viewers. If you guys are here, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. I will feel them to Chris as we go. Um, and, uh, yeah, just let me know what you want to learn, what you want to know about. Um, but so, okay. So to start off, did you want to give us like a little bit of a background on like why you wrote this book? Cause this was your, this came out in 20, what is it? 2012, I think. Yeah. Sounds right. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, this book was, um, well, sort of inspired by conversations I had with NASA people who, um, the history division at NASA, I knew that I knew that there's a person who has the title of historian of NASA, which is kind of an interesting job, a good job. His name is Stephen Dick, and I known him for a long time. And he said, "Oh, you, we really should have a book about, you know, NASA missions or missions NASA has been associated with that are the were the most iconic over the last decades, you know, pretty mm -hmm. much." since the early days of the space era. Um, and and it would be nice if it had a broad perspective, you know, not just technical stuff about how the missions worked and how they were built and the instruments and so on, and even just the gory details of the science, but took a broader cultural lens. Um, so that was the beginning. And then that sort of led to the collaboration because I knew a, a professor, Holly Henry, uh, works in Los Angeles, and she's an English professor, but she's very heavily interested in space studies and um, has written, you know, academic articles about space and astronomy from a perspective of a humanist um, about their impact on the popular culture and so on. So it was a good, seemed like a good collaboration. I hadn't written a book with someone else before, I'd, except a textbook, an astronomy textbook. Mm -hmm. So this was, you know, a new process, but it worked well. You know, she had a, she brought a different perspective. And so we tried to um, you know, talk about what makes some subset of the NASA missions special because they resonate with the public or they, you know, they sort of transcended just the pure astronomy of the mission or the planetary science to become part of how we think about the universe. 
so that was what we were aiming for. And then there's a lot of arbitrary choices. You know, how do you choose those top missions there? You know, there, there could be argument about that. There's, of course, a few things that have happened since the book, but, mm -hmm. you know, would have got in it now. Um, so but we haven't updated it yet. So that was the story of how it started. And so, uh, speaking of Holly Henry, how did you guys, um, how did you guys first like meet and decide to write the book together? And then how, how did that process go about? Cause you said it was your first uh, book besides a textbook that you've written with someone else. Right. So I've known Holly for decades because, um, there's a thing, this is a little sidebar on a kind of cool part of the astronomy landscape as far as interdisciplinary work goes. There's a, there's been a series of meetings that now number 11, I think, every couple of years called the Inspiration of Astronomical Phenomena, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, its abbreviation is INSAP. So the, these meetings are, are kind of very, well, a lot of fun for scientists or for the people coming from other perspectives because they're about astronomy, but how it relates to other endeavors. So at, a, at an INSAP meeting, there'll be, there won't be straight up astronomy talks, research talk. That's not what it's about. There'll be talks about archaeoastronomy. There will be talks about history of astronomy. There will be talks about. There'll be dis, uh, you know, there's often galleries and exhibits. There'll be sculpture, astronomical art, sometimes performance. So it's really very broad. Um, it's just how people reflect on astronomy in other areas, creative arts, or. Uh, and so on. So those conferences are fun. Everyone's different. They've been in cool parts of the world, Rome and Malta, and um, I can't remember all the places we've been, a couple in the U.S. And Holly's been to most of them, and I've been to most of them. So I've met her every few years at those meetings, and we realized we had common interests. So it was a, it was a pretty easy collaboration to set up because I'd met her before. And, and to writing at a distance, it's not that hard, you know, these days, you just, we were sort of splitting each chapter in half. Um, and I think the challenge there, the clear challenge there is how do you, um, you know, smooth over the differences, inevitable differences in writing style and approach mm -hmm. to make it, and, and we had good editor helping us on this book, that, that makes a big difference too. Uh, sometimes publishers don't really help with editing. That, and that's actually kind of the norm now that they don't help with editing. You just write a book, whatever, write the book, make it good, you know. So, um, so it was a very easy process. You know, we'd write our parts of the chapter and then we'd put them together, read it, and realize the problems or the disjoint things or something that I thought she'd cover and she didn't, or vice versa, or, um, you know, stylistic uh, issues between us. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, you know, it, it took iterations, of course. It took, a, you know, a year and a half. Most books take at least a year. This one took maybe a little longer because it was a collaboration and there was a lot of material we had to absorb and so on. And she knows enough astronomy, even though she's an English professor, that, you know, I didn't have to educate her about really the astronomy of these missions or yeah. planetary science, just in the details, yes, but not generally. And mm -hmm. I, I've read enough history and critical theory and, you know, I, I have enough of a broad education that I know her level, her type of scholarship, too. So yeah. it was yeah, pretty easy, actually. Yeah, I thought it was um, reading through it. And I'm sure uh, some of the other viewers uh, thought the same. There's like uh, you guys did like a really nice job of of not having that disconnect. Like I I didn't really no, like I couldn't figure out how you guys divided things up, which I think is a, you know, a good thing because yeah. you said um, every chapter you kind of did half and half and it uh, it really blends really nicely. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was cool. Yeah, you get the, the science, um, the science side of things and the, you know, the, what's it called? Um, the explanations of, of why why we're doing this and why the science is important and like, uh, what we're going to be learning and researching and stuff like that, but you also get some of that, um, like, uh, why is this important to humans as a whole and, like, how this will affect other other areas of uh, people's lives, um, which I think is pretty cool. And I think one of the things we realized 
both in making the selection, you know, we actually did churn the initial selection of missions a few times before we embarked. I don't think midstream we had second thoughts, but we definitely thought hard about which missions to pick because there mm-hmm. could only be so many, you know, it's a dozen or so chapters, so that's your choice. We wanted to balance between planetary science and the solar system and the universe at large and mm-hmm. not, you know, not make it too U.S. centric, although NASA sort of you know, NASA connections inspired the book. It mm-hmm. also does include missions that were European or had a heavy European presence. Yeah. A few that had Japanese involvement. Um, so the mission choice was a big issue. And then, but I think we were trying to reach for missions that just had a sway beyond the technical community, just beyond astronomers, that, that it, an average person if they realized what the mission was about or had seen any of the images or data from it, they would go, oh, yeah, I know why they did that. You know, I, I realize why that's important and yeah. why we spent money on that mission as opposed to doing something else because that was the bar we held. And some are easier than others. I mean, Hubble is in there, Hubble Space Telescope, and that's unimpeachable and, of course, would always be in any list of your top 12. But uh, some others are maybe not as well known, and we were also hoping to you know, educate or like surprise people a little bit with some of the things that they might not have realized were that important. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually, I was wondering about that, uh, like the mission selection process. Uh, Were there any uh, missions that you wish you could have included if you had just like one extra chapter, um, either like that were, you know, current or ones if you like, if you did another edition that you could like add since... There's one, you know, we, as soon as we considered a second edition, I don't know if we'll get to do a second edition. That's up to the publisher. I think it sold moderately well. I mean, it's not a, it's not a very mass market book, of course. It's a university press, but um, it's, and it's written, you know, it's semi-technical because the science is semi-technical and we have the scholarship in there. It's, it's heavily referenced, you know, mm-hmm. both her side and my side. So it's academic at that level. Um, yeah, if we had, it, we've already talked about it. If we had to add one chapter, it's, it's almost a no brainer. It'd be Kepler, it'd be the mission that found exoplanets. Yeah. So it clearly deserves to be in there. Um, and it's done, it's been up and finished its work now. So it wouldn't actually be that hard to write. I've already written about Kepler for a set of a number of articles. So that writing an extra chapter for another edition and updating the things that are still going on like Hubble itself and so mm-hmm. on that wouldn't be that hard yeah yeah it was so funny when we were reading especially the stuff I mean obviously the earlier chapters are very much like and there has been nothing you know nothing's been going on with Viking since or anything you know um but uh especially getting towards the end um there were a few where it was like oh and actually let's check and see if this spacecraft is still alive right. and some of them are, are have finished their uh, journeys since but um yeah what other questions do i have for you also folks if you guys um i see there's people in uh the people watching i haven't seen any chats i'm a little worried that my chat room is messed up but um Feel free to ask uh, any questions that you guys want. Um, I will field those to Chris. Um, let's see. So um, this might be kind of a hard question, or maybe not. I don't know. But um, out of all the missions in the book, um, is there one that stands out to you as the most influential of the ones that you chose? Well, it is the you know it it, it is Hubble in the end because Hubble Space Telescope has been going over 30 years now and Mm -hmm. um it's you know it's just iconic people forget how small that telescope is it's uh it was it was uh constrained because it had to fit in the shuttle bay since it was being launched by the space shuttle and the shuttle bay is not that large so it's you know it's a 2.4 meter mirror in a in its telescope and that's as big as you could fit something it totally filled the shuttle bay when they launched it well, 2.4 meters is really small. I mean, by modern standards, I think I haven't kept track, but I think in the current listing of the world's largest telescopes, I don't think it makes the top 70. It's really, <laughs> there are amateur astronomers who have telescope mirrors almost that size. I know there are some that are two meters and yeah. 
amateur astronomer hands. So that's the first surprise, that how could such a moderate-sized telescope be so influential, so effective? And part of the answer is where it is. It's in the Earth orbit, which is just way better than on the ground. No atmosphere, no rain, no clouds. Um, super sharp imaging through a vacuum. Ultraviolet radiation and infrared radiation detected easily. They get absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So just a bunch of reasons why Earth orbit is better than on the ground for a telescope. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. It's longevity, of course. It was, you know, NASA, it was NASA's flagship mission. It was only one of it, NASA's so-called great observatories, but it was clearly the most successful one. Um, so NASA never stinted on resources for it. It was serviced five times by, by astronauts. And that's key, too, because the instruments were replaced. When a telescope goes into space, um, the lead time on flight certifying the instruments is three to five years mm -hmm. so basically the design not just the design but the instruments the whole thing is frozen well ahead of launch and that means in the rapidly moving area of technology that means detectors and how we detect light and build instruments you've you're sort of locked into slightly old technology mm -hmm. by the time you launch and that's just inevitable um, and it's because the process of flight certifying hardware is very thorough. They have to put it, they take it to a NASA center and put it in a thermal vacuum and they give it shake tests and they expose it to cosmic rays and UV radiation and, you know, they, it, and it's got to work flawlessly in the lab for a year or two before they even think of putting it in a spacecraft. So that's how thorough they are and it just, but it means your instrument's so a little old by the time you launch it and then when it's been up a few years, it's really getting old. And the stuff on the ground is better. So the servicing of Hubble was really critical because it meant its instruments were rejuvenated every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so it, that let it kept pace with, keep pace with best instruments on the ground. So those are the two things that marked Hubble out, I think, and part of why it was so successful. Yeah. Hopefully uh, Hubble, we talked about this a little bit last, uh, last week on our news stream. And I know Hubble's uh, having some issues with the computers, um, mm -hmm. or they thought it was computers, and now they think it's something else. But hopefully, they can uh, get that back up and running because we still have a little bit of time before JWST. Right, um, and they were always supposed to overlap. I mean, that's been made difficult because JWST has been delayed years, almost yeah. a decade, and Hubble now is a pretty old telescope, and mm -hmm. it's been moving along. Um, you know, Hubble's been serviced all those times, but after the last servicing mission, they were very clear they weren't going to service it again. And then the, the shuttle was, of course, shut down, so there was yeah. not even a way to do it. Um, and so it's been aging. The biggest failure mode has been gyroscopes. So Hubble needed, Hubble had four gyroscopes when it was first built and by design, and that's, that's quite a lot of redundancy. Um, and the gyroscopes are critical. That's how it points on the sky and how it moves. And, um, and so Hubble can all, could always afford to lose one gyroscope with no compromise to its capabilities. That's a, that was a pure redundancy to have four. Mm -hmm. It can also function with two. So if it loses two gyros out of four, which has happened several times now, um, there's, a, there's a clever way of using one of the instruments, the fine guidance sensor, to act indirectly as a locking mechanism, so sort of like a gyroscope. Mm -hmm. And that not quite as good as the original spec, but lets Hubble point pretty accurately and keep doing its work. And, but when you down to one gyro, you're dead in the water. I mean, Hubble, they shut, the telescope has to shut down, basically. Yeah. And, and that has happened once, not, not in the time span of writing the book, but since then. So Hubble's, you know, Achilles heel, if you like, are these gyroscopes. And this interesting sidebar on that is these gyroscopes, like everything else, are you know, incredibly extensively tested on the ground. They're very, the technology is quite mature. There have been gyroscopes installed in spacecraft and mm -hmm. probe, entry probes for decades. And they have, you know, that technology pretty nailed. And so the gyroscopes that are in Hubble were a type that they used on other missions, and they were spinning in a lab and sometimes simulating space conditions for years and years and years and none ever failed. Yeah. 
but then when it gets into orbit, they start failing every few years. And nobody to this day really knows why the failure rate in orbit was so much worse than on the ground. Yeah. But that's just what happens. So, and the other issue, of course, is solar panels. The uh, Hubble needs power up there, and it can't come from the Earth, so it comes from solar power. And, and over time, solar panels degrade, just the material degrades because it's, uh, it's, you know, subject to a lot of radiation and pitting by micrometeorites and all sorts of things are happening. So solar panels just do not fare well over a long time in space. And so Hubble's had pro power problems too, you know, and so these are all things that happen to a telescope when it gets old. But, um, but to the book, I think the thing that we locked in on, and Holly did a lot of this too from her area, was that unsingularly for any facility, any NASA telescope for sure, and pretty much any space mission, uh, Hubble captured the popular imagination and its images are so gorgeous and so many people have screensavers or posters or, you know, copies of the images somewhere in their computer, mm -hmm. um, that it established itself as the sort of preeminent chronicler of the heavens in terms of taking pictures of everything in, in beautiful color. And the sidebar on that that's important, I think we talk about, yeah, we talk about in the chapter, is that um, they made a very clever decision early on. I mean, when you look at an image of a pulsar, which is a radio emitting neutron star or a supernova remnant in x-rays. So we take images across the electromagnetic spectrum and you'll see pictures of these in magazines and online. And they're false color, of course, because radio, you can't see radio waves, you can't see x-rays. And so, you know, there's sort of almost artistic decision made of how to turn what is essentially just intensity, which should really be a grayscale, black and white, mm -hmm. into color just to make it look nicer. I mean, you can sort of make high energy be bluer and low energy be redder, sort of like photons, but it's not photons, it's not yeah. light. So these images are false color. And, and, and a lot of optical images are false color. People really forget, because there's so many out in the web that have been amped up and out of all recognition, the planets in the solar system are very muted in their colors. The yeah. Mars is not bright red or orangey red. Jupiter and Saturn are extremely pallid. I mean, most of the colors of the major planets, the gas giants, are, are these sort of just muddy, muted, uh, brown, yellow-brown sort of color. Mm -hmm. So you see all these highly amped up NASA images of planets and moons, and you sort of most people just don't realize that's not really the color they are. You know, if you see them through a telescope, which you can, then you see that they're pretty mild. Mm -hmm. And Hubble made the decision as a project to not do that all the time, especially from the project. I mean, when people get the images themselves, they can do whatever they want with them. If you get the yeah. digital image, you can mess with it. But the images released by the project that they took great pride in, they deliberately made the, sci the color scientifically realistic. You know, it doesn't to say they didn't amp up the contrast sometimes or change the color table a bit, but they didn't mess with it terribly. And that's sort of the unknown part of all these beautiful images that they're not, and, and the pride of the project, that these are not just beautiful, iconic images, pillars of God and aurora and storms on Jupiter and distant spiral galaxies and so on. They're real, their colors are real. And if you're a scientist, you can look at the colors and say, oh, these are young stars, these are old stars, there's mm -hmm. dust there. There's, you know, you can draw conclusions from the pictures without having the actual data. So that was, a, I think, a very powerful success of that project to do that. And that's part of what resonated with the public because the, I think they understood and many appreciated that they were, of course, beautiful images, but they were real images. Yeah. They, they weren't being fooled or they weren't faked out uh, yeah. by some manipulation that was done. It wasn't just some like art piece sort of thing. It was actual like um, images that would be used for research too, sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much. That's cool. Uh, so we have a couple questions from our uh, viewers. Uh, Lynn Jersey asked, was it hard to curtail the amount of information for each chapter? Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Because yes, because well, Hubble is a great example, but others are like this too, because there's so much science. The amount of Hubble 
and and of, and of course books dozens of books have now been written about the Hubble Space Telescope so that's an extreme case where it had to be very I had to be very selective about the science that I talked about but that's true of all all the missions and so it's just a matter of deciding you know what's the what are the most important handful of things this mission did in, in terms of teaching us about that aspect of the universe so you'd have to be you know have to be a little disciplined in approaching each mission and that's a judgment too because different scientists would say well this was important or this was important you know not all scientists agree even about what comes out of a particular mission so i was you know using my judgments as a personal choice at some level but i know what my colleagues say and i read around so i think i re i hope i represented it reasonably well mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we have Yangik with a question about um, Hubble and uh, Galex. I actually don't know what mission that is. G-A-L-E-X. Um, uh, and black holes. Um, so they asked a question about uh, black hole um, physicality, I guess. Black hole makeup. Um, so they're wondering if, uh, based on what Hubble's seen if a uh, black hole surface can be considered a carbon-rich texture and if a black hole charge can be t conducted by heavy water like condensed matters mm. um, and then also in general um, will new space telescopes have a large have large changes for how they look at black holes and like um, active galactic nuclei things like that right um to no, i'm not sure i connect them directly but galax the other mission quoted that's an ultraviolet explore mission gotcha. um, that did imaging and some, some spectroscopy and it was, so it was looking at very hot stars very young galaxies and so on so it's a science that overlaps Hubble a little bit but it sort of did its own thing because it was working purely in the ultraviolet as opposed to Hubble which extended to the ultraviolet that did a lot of visible and infrared work mm -hmm. um, as far as black holes go there's no you know this the Black holes are a physically very simple object. They just have a vent horizon and a singularity, we think. Singularity is hidden. That's a cusp of density, infinite density at the center, which doesn't make physical sense, but that's part of why we know black hole theory is incomplete. And so we never see a singularity. Um, it's hidden behind the event horizon. The event horizon is the surface, not a physical surface. That's key. Just an information barrier that stops you from knowing what happens inside. So that is essentially the surface that defines where the escape velocity is that speed of light. And since nothing can go faster than light, um, that means nothing can get out. So that's the event horizon. And it's not a surface, it's in, so questions that alluded to a surface are not quite accurate because it's not a physical surface. It's mm -hmm. just a barrier of information. And so we can't really talk about what it's like physically because well, we can't inspect the interior of a black hole. We can just describe this limit to our information. Um, and, and telescopes are not, until very recently, until the Event Horizon Telescope took this spectacular image of M87 two years ago, we haven't been able to look at black holes. It, Hubble has not been able to, nor has any other telescope until the Event Horizon Telescope recently. Um, so those are the ways in now and in the future, we actually need new tools to take pictures of black holes um, because it's conventional optical telescopes essentially can't do it. They're too, they're too small physically. They're too small. They're far away. Mm -hmm. The event horizon is a very small size in kilometers, and they're trillions and trillions of kilometers away. So you need it's pretty special techniques to inspect black holes. Yeah. I mean, just to get the the first image of a black hole that we got a couple of years ago they used a essentially a telescope the size of the earth right so yeah. the event horizon telescope which is really cool if you guys want to look that up it's uh it's cool to see the map of of what telescopes they use for that also um 40s gamer thank you so much for following welcome to the teach astronomy family um we have a, another question from uh lynn jersey uh which unmanned space mission gave the most useful information overall in your opinion yeah, that's in the solar system. That's a hard question because there, have, of course, have been many. Um, you know, I think it, even though it's old, one of the older missions, I would probably choose Viking because 
because it made such a difference in what we thought. We, mm -hmm. we didn't know anything about Mars, really, at all. Um, there have been a couple of flybys, and that's it. So that first landing on an, any other planet was, you know, really profound. And um, it's, of course, twin orbiters and twin landers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so those were transformational because they pretty much, well, they sort of dashed the hopes of people who thought Mars would be a living planet because they just showed what an arid, frigid desert it really was. Yeah. Um, however, Viking also, this is again, people don't quite always appreciate this, Viking had, was very forward-looking instrumentation. So there were a series of four experiments that were really trying to look for life. They were digging up the soil near the surface, uh, adding nutrients and seeing what happened. They were taking another one, took samples of soil and baked it in an oven to see what came off. And so there was this set of very cleverly designed experiments. Again, designed this; these were all designed like in the late '60s mm -hmm. to do their work in the next decade. Um, and they were looking for life, and one turned an ambiguous result. And to this day, the PI of that instrument is in its late '80s now. The Wolf Trap experiment is called. Gil Levin is the name of the scientist. He maintains that the ambiguous result of his instrument on Viking could have been still could indicate microbial life, not not photosynthetic, though, probably metabolizing methane or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that was a very forward-looking experiment. And it's fair to say that since then, all the clever rovers we have, including the one that's there right now, uh, are not really doing life detection any better than Viking did. Yeah. So uh, that's a pretty amazing uh, mission if you can be so far ahead of the curve and so transformational in what you tell people about a whole planet that you've never landed on so it was a tour de force the whole the whole mission you know it wasn't that expensive um it was two missions a lot of complexity it was this remote landing um instruments that had to work at a distance complex uh, life detection capabilities etc and it also outlived its design spec by a long, by a long way. Yeah. Um, the Pixel said uh, they always thought that the Viking experiments were somewhat rudimentary or naive, but um, it seems like that's not the case. That's really cool. Um, also, thank you, uh, Tiny Witch Draws, for following. Welcome to the Teach Astronomy family. I love that uh, that name. Uh, speaking of um, some of uh, the like most useful information that we've gathered through these um, unmanned uh, space exploration missions. Uh, would you say, in your opinion, there's like a certain like type of mission that uh, you see as more valuable than others? Like first, like, like when we talk about like sample collection versus orbiter versus, um, you know, space telescope versus um, rover lander sort of thing. Right. Well, there's sort of two categories, and in the book, both are represented, and they don't, and they're sort of not really competing with each other because they do such different things. There, there are sort of solar system exploration missions, um, probe landers, probe sample return. Of course, that's that's not happening very much. We're still waiting to get some moon samples and Mars samples back after 50 years. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's the solar system exploration which is always on that, of course, and robotic. Uh, and then there's the more general astronomy, telescopes in space of different kinds, different wavelengths. And they're doing very different things. So you sort of, in the balanced portfolio of astronomy, planetary science missions, you need both. And there are actually different sections of the astronomy community that deal with those missions that set priorities. And, um, and they're, they are often funded in the U.S. by NASA, of course, so the same funding money comes out of the same big pot. Um, but those two are different. And as for their capabilities, well, telescopes, you know, now you have to, you know, you just want to keep moving the bar on how good your instruments are. I mean, the optical telescope design hasn't really changed much for hundreds of years. So the Hubble Space Telescope is not fundamentally different from the Newtonian telescope design that Isaac Newton built, much smaller versions of. So telescope design hasn't changed much, but the instruments, of course, have advanced a lot. So that's where you put your 
thought, attention, and quite a lot of the money. Mm -hmm. For plant tree probes, um, you know, there's a debate because uh, it's quite challenging. It's obviously much more challenging to have a lander than just to have an orbiter. It's even much more challenging still to sample return from any object, and we've done it very rarely. I mean, we have done it now. Of course, we've done it from asteroids, comets, and the moon. And, you know, we hope to do it for Mars soon, but it's pretty rare and it's pretty expensive and it's pretty difficult. So, you know, I think only a few missions get to be that ambitious to try that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You can learn a lot from orbiters. I mean, that's that's the standard mission in solar system astronomy. You know, you send a probe to go into orbit around a planet and visit its moons and then maybe use gravitational slingshot to send it somewhere else in the solar system, get as much bang for the buck as you can. And orbiters are sort of the bread and butter of planetary science. Mm -hmm. um, landers are tricky because you've got to make a choice. You've got to decide where you're going to put your lander. And yeah. we, when we go to Mars, that's a big issue. Where do you, if you had to just pick one place for your expensive piece of hardware, how do you do that? I mean, the, the current rover, um, Perseverance on Mars uh, years ago went through a, a, a long process involving a lot of planetary science community uh, and a series of conferences where they went from like 124 possible landing spots down to 32 to 16 to 4 to 2 to 1. Mm -hmm. And that took years and people literally voted on it and expert opinions were taken because you, you're putting all your money on one, it's like a roulette wheel, you're putting all your money on one number. So landers are tricky because you're replacing a bet yeah whereas an orbiter like high rise the one of the mars orbiters still working that's run by the u of a um it's got this made these incredible maps of mars down to the level of a meter so everything sofa sized or chair sized and larger image and it can just keep going orbiting the planet for years maybe decades if mm -hmm. the memories last so orbiters are a bit safer in that regard which is why they're more orbiters than landers. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so Pixel has a question. Uh, I'm wondering if there's still a strong competitiveness between space agencies uh, with space probes since the end of the Cold War, or have missions become mostly collaborative? And I think that's a little bit discussed in uh, some of the chapters in the book. Yeah, that's definitely alluded to. I mean, it's, it's, it's mostly an international activity. I think I would say independent of the Cold War origins of the space race and the geopolitical intense uh, battle between Russia and the United States for decades, mostly space science and astronomy are, are international. Um, so, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope for over th 30 years has been 85% NASA and 15% European Space Agency. So Europeans get 15% of the time on the telescope, American or American-based scientists, 85%. And many missions in the book and, and that didn't get into the book have a model like that, where they're collaborative with uh, the Europeans and the Americans classically, but also the Japanese and the Americans, sometimes the Russians. Not, it's not as common, of course, now, because the geopolitical tension has you know, gone away and then come back and then gone away and come back. So we're not super pally with the Russians right now or recently. Um, China is a big cipher in this because um, America's had a very hard-nosed attitude towards China for a couple of decades, um, where essentially U.S. scientists are prohibited from working on Chinese missions or, or collaborating very, even very extensively with Chinese scientists or visiting there. Um, mm -hmm. So it, that's rooted in, you know, deep suspicion of China's motives in space, even though they're doing really good astronomy and space science. So they, it would be natural to collaborate them, with them on occasion. Yeah. So with the exception of, you know, the, the newish aversion to working with China and the historical trickiness of working with Russia, it's very collaborative. And, and part of that's practical. It, these things cost a lot of money. And, you know, you, America, NASA only doesn't have a huge budget. NASA's budget in real terms is half as much as it was 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. people don't realize that actually. NASA has not done well as a fraction of the GDP. It's less than 20 years ago. So, you know, they can't do as much. 
as they used to or as they would want to. Mm-hmm. And actually, that leads into a question that uh, I had one of our um, Discord users ask me before we started. Um, as far as like the expenses of uh, some of these missions, which uh, are mentioned um, in within their chapters and everything, um, it seemed like uh, some of the NASA missions are have like been historically more expensive than some of the like ESA only or like um, the. ISRO missions that have been more recent and stuff like that. Is there a reason for that? Or is that just something that? Uh... There's a part, it's, that's not always true, but it, it, there's some element of truth to that. And there's the reason for that is that for if not unilaterally or uniformly, but there has been a more, a, a sort of history where European missions are slightly more targeted, more focused on one particular scientific question or one type of science. NASA has has often felt like they have to serve very broad communities of astronomers or planetary scientists, so they tend mm-hmm. to design very broad missions. So they're NASA, the Hubble Space Telescope, again, perfect example, or the X-ray observatories or any of the great observatories, they have to be like Swiss Army knives. They have to do everything. Yeah. And that makes them very expensive because you're serving all these different communities who want different things from the telescope. In Europe, they've just been a little more uh, careful about not letting you know mission creep happen and let a telescope have to suddenly do everything they want to they keep the focus fairly tight Mm -hmm. now nasa does that too and there are two really good examples one's in the book and the other is what i would add to the book uh in a second edition w map is a great example of a very focused nasa mission it was just designed to map the microwave sky extremely Mm -hmm. accurately to one thousandth of a percent precision and that's all I did for years, for almost 10 years. Uh, and it led us to know the Big Bang in the early days better than ever before. And it wasn't that expensive, a mission. So WMAP, uh, microwave satellite, you know, did one thing exceptionally well. It didn't cost that much money compared to Hubble, say. And Kepler is another good example. It was designed also to just do one thing very well, to stare at 165,000 stars and find what fraction of them had occasional transits from a planet Mm -hmm. passing in front of the star. And that's all it did. And it did that for seven years, and it found hundreds of Earth-like planets. So um, it was also incredibly successful and really well-focused and not that expensive compared to Hubble. NASA does know how to tighten the focus and specialist missions too but the europeans have probably done a little more of that over the years gotcha that makes sense um not a question but just a comment that i wanted to share with you uh lynn jersey said uh they appreciated the way the book was written they learned a lot and have very little knowledge of astronomy or the space programs uh it must be hard with so much knowledge on the subject to write in a way that everyone can understand um so just a Nice, nice to hear. Yes, I try, we try, and I mean, Holly and I both tried to. I mean, she was my sounding board as well because she's not an astronomer, so it's actually helpful to write a book with an English professor. <laughs> I mean, apart from the fact that it could be annoying if she corrects your grammar all the time, <laughs> uh, it's very useful to have someone reacting to what you write to just say, "Oh, you know, that's just too dense," or "That part, it, you kind of lost me there," or "That, you know, you don't need to go into that detail." So that was a very useful thing. I haven't had that, the benefit of that on other books I've written. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I'm editing for that. And like I said, publishers don't edit anymore, so that you have to do it yourself. Yeah. Um, if you could choose your own unmanned mission, where would you choose to go and what would you study? Well, I think, I mean, this is one that is planned, but it's very far off, really. Um, I mean, I would go back to uh, Titan large moon of Saturn. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, Titan is a compelling target and it's possible there's some exotic form of biology there. So, but it's, it's a very, it's an, it's a huge, it's a large moon that has an atmosphere denser than ours made of the same stuff we're breathing, nitrogen for the most part, but it's very far from the sun. So it's cold and there are these ethane, methane lakes. And if you look at a picture of the surface, it looks earth-like. There's lakes and estuaries and rivers and you know snow-capped mountains but it's not water snow it's ammonia or carbon dioxide snow um 
so going there with a and we landed on it or rather this was another form of the collaborative nature of the Cassini mission so Cassini went there and did incredible work for a decade in the Saturnian system around Saturn and its moons um, and part of the Cassini spacecraft which is one of these big very expensive multi-billion dollar missions mm -hmm. was the Huygens lander and that was built by the Europeans named after a Dutch astronomer of course um, and Huygens landed on Titan, was never designed to last long or do much, but it, it took pictures all the way down, sensed the surface and the air and the atmosphere all the way down, and it sent back data for about half an hour before its batteries died. And, and that's the only time we've landed on any other world, really, in the outer, anywhere in the outer solar system. It's a billion miles from Earth, incredible achievement. Mm -hmm. When that's all we got, half an hour, and that was 15, 16 years ago. So. Yeah really like to go back with the best, the technology we have now so that would be my choice and the mo technology we'd send which is also well known to nasa because they have design studies would essentially be drones or gyrocopters so you'd have um, um it's a thick atmosphere like i said as thick as the air we're breathing so you can the helicopter or drone idea works very well there so you just send a drone and you allow it to settle on the various lakes or surfaces and sample through spectroscopic sniffing and sensing of what was in there. Um, and you'd learn so much more than we know from just one little thing that dropped on there and took data for half an hour. So that would be my bet for sure. Yeah. And we have, uh, that's that's the Dragonfly mission that's going to be going there eventually, right? Yeah. 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 I know it's still a little bit far off, but should be exciting once it finally uh, gets going. Um, and I know you said you had to leave a little early, so I think we'll probably just do one more question and then wrap up with you. Um, but I, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, so we talked about some of the, you know, some of the chapters, like what, what mission you thought was most influential, which one, um, you know, where would, what would you add, things like that. But uh, did you have a favorite chapter uh, for like writing or researching, research, yeah, researching, um, either because of like maybe some of the stories you uncovered about it or because you were able to, you know, write about something that was really familiar to you or maybe not familiar to you and got to learn about it, something like that. Yeah, and it probably would be the earlier missions because, I mean, the later ones, the current missions, things like Hubble and so on and WMAP, the sort of cosmology missions, I know those, I'm very familiar with them. So that was, they were easier to write. You know, I'd pick Viking again as an example because that, you know, that predates me being an astronomer and I don't remember, of course, it happening in real time. So researching that was interesting because I just learned, it just made me more and more impressed by how amazing a mission that was. Um, you know, and just lots of stories along the way. The little story about how the Viking landers were designed originally without cameras um, because they didn't think that they, it was interesting. They'd already had orbiters to show the surface, so they knew what the surface looked like, more or less, which is rocks and desert and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so they just, to cut weight and to save money, they just weren't, didn't have cameras. They were going to dig the soil and, and test it chemically and do that kind of uh, sensing. Uh, and it was Carl Sagan, you know, one of the iconic astronomers of the first part, of, you know, the second half of the 20th century, who um, on the advisory committee just strenuously argued that you need cameras and he was he knew it, he argued it multiple ways he said well you need cameras because you know you do need to see the surface I mean just seeing, see you might see something that you know you can see some distance farther from where the rover it's not a rover it's just a lander it didn't move yeah so you're gonna see something that you might want to follow up or that you might need to explain uh, second of all, he said, you know, he knew that that would engage the public more. He said, yeah. the public is not going to care so much if we land things on Mars and they're just doing these little chemical experiments and then some data comes out and nobody knows how to look at it or interpret it or present it to the public. So you need the cameras so people can see pictures of Mars. That matters. And then almost glibly, but not totally tongue in cheek, he said, and aren't we going to look silly if there are polar bears on Mars? <laughs> we send a camera to take pictures of them. So, so that's those are the kind. And so I saw, I read in research, I just encountered, you know, a set of stories about Viking 
mm-hmm. you know, lead up to it and the mission itself and the people who did it. And that, that was, you know, I learned a lot, you know, from that because it was so long ago that I, I didn't know all these stories. Yeah. yeah well, it was, uh, it was excellent reading it. It was uh, really great learning about a lot of uh, these missions that like I, you know, as someone who uh, has is not a uh, astronomer by uh, degree or anything, but has been in an astronomy group for a, f- a few years now um, that I like know of, but haven't really like delved deep into. This was a really fun book to uh, to do that with, and I think a lot of our viewers also really enjoyed it. Um, oh, Lorraine said, "Sounds like a great book, and they're going to be buying it to check it out." Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, being here and talking to us about it, for writing it in the first place. <laughs> sure. It's, it's um, nice, nice to chat about a book. I yeah. like books and uh, great, great questions from you and from the visitors to this session. So thank you. Yeah, we'll let you go. I know you have another meeting coming up soon. But uh, before we end, really quick, just a reminder for everyone else. Um, as far as the rest of the, week, rest of the week goes, I actually have to cancel our stream tomorrow. Uh, my other job has messed up my schedule. So uh, we will be skipping astronomy news this week. But on Friday, we'll be back with amateur astronomy. And then next week, uh, we should be back to our regular schedule uh, for Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we will be doing something new on uh, on Monday. So be sure to be there. So thank you again, Chris. And uh, thank you, everybody, okay. for watching. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.